2018. This is the Berean Bible Fellowship. We have a lot of young people with us this morning, so I'm going to adjust my vocabulary accordingly <laughs> and try to make this as uh, simple and as easy to understand as possible. I should probably do that every week, uh, but uh, since we have small children, uh, young, young people today, Quite a few. I'm going to probably adjust the message a little bit. I remember as a young person growing up, uh, my dad always used to tell me, when you're doing public speaking, you always have to consider your audience. Now, think about who you're speaking to. Now, we're online as well, and it's impossible to consider my audience because I don't know who's listening online. Uh, but I have small children, quite a few young people here today, so... Uh, bear with us. Be patient bear with us. The topic of today's message is the restoration of the mystery. The restoring of the mystery. Now right away some of you are going to ask the question in terms of the mystery. What is the mystery? And why does it need to be restored? And those are valid questions. Well, when we use the word restoration, a lot of folks would replace that word restoration. And in Christian circles, we would use a term like revival. When you use the word revival, Christians are very familiar with this term revival. And we've had revivals down through the history over the past 2,000 years of the church. Um, but I would dare say that most of those revivals were not revivals that were honoring to God. And probably one revival that meant something of substance was with Martin Luther. They talked about the, Refor the Reformation because they talked about restoring the understanding that you're saved by grace through faith. Right? You're justified. You're declared righteous by God's grace. And that comes through faith. So when we talk about something as simple as the gospel... The word gospel means good news. It means good news. When we talk about salvation, knowing that your sins are forgiven, knowing that you have a relationship with God, and that in the future, when God raises the dead and the rapture of the church takes place, you're going to be in the presence of God. You're going to be in the presence of the Lord as a saved person. And the technical term is a member of the body of Christ. Now the Bible uses lots of incredible words, vocabulary, and it's important that we understand that God uses a very precise word because he's trying to convey a certain message. And that requires very technical sometimes language. So he uses the right word to get across the correct meaning of what he wants to say. We might say that he says what he means and he means what he says. Right? But we've gotten in discussions with people, and sometimes they'll argue. They'll say, well, it says all, but it doesn't really mean all. Well, God is absolute truth. And he chooses his words judiciously. In other words, he's very careful in picking the exact word that he wants to use to convey a specific meaning. Well, and people are quick to say, oh, that's your interpretation of the Bible. Well, if the Bible can be interpreted a hundred different ways, it's useless. What good would it be? Right? What good would it be? If you as, as a parent, if I were to say to my child as a parent, don't stick your finger in the socket of the wall. Don't plug things in there. My kids were small. They liked to experiment. And I have to cover up those like, little plugs in the, <laughs> in the sockets of the wall because I didn't want them sticking things in there. I understand that they could get electrocuted. One mistake like that would be fatal, of course. So I said what I meant, and I meant what I said, and I took precautions to make sure, to ensure that that kind of mistake won't take place. Do you know that God does the exact same thing in His Word? So that when you read the Word of God, the Bible, you can get the correct interpretation. There's only one correct interpretation of every verse in the Bible. Now, there may be many applications that are different. You may be able to apply it in lots of different circumstances. That's true. But there's only one correct 
interpretation. Now, when we're opening our Bible, and here we are, members of the body of Christ, saved people who love the Lord Jesus Christ, who know Him personally, how can we understand the Bible? Well, the Bible is divided up into different sections. And we hand out this chart, which is a beautifully done illustration. I'm going to put it right up there so we can see it on camera. We don't have the, the life-size one we sometimes have, but we've got the little one. And many of you have seen this chart. And we see the Bible divided up into times past. There's the past. Then we have what's called the right now, which is the present. The present has been about 2,000 years now. And we have what's called the ages to come. That threefold vision. Past, times past. The present, which is referred to as the but now. And the ages to come. This information is located, by the way, in Scripture. We've got it in uh, Ephesians. Time past, we see it in uh, Ephesians 2, 11 and 12. That expression, the but now, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. The ages to come, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7. So if you're looking and you'd like to see where in the Bible this is, and you should check out everything we say. Be a good Berean, check everything out. Those are the verses. Very easy to find. To see that for yourself. Well, we ask the question, well, what applies to us? All of the Bible is for us to read, right, to understand, but not all of the Bible is given to us as instruction. In other words, our, what, are, what are the rules, what are the house rules that apply to us? We talked about that word dispensation before. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, don't you know that a dispensation has been given to me? Don't you know that God has given me something very special here? He's given Paul a dispensation. Paul is called the apostle to the Gentiles. Now if we go in the Old Testament, Julius mentioned Moses a few minutes ago. Moses was given the law. Moses is called the lawgiver. It's even called the law of Moses. Is it Moses' law? Of course it's the law, God's law that he gave to man through Moses. But if you didn't listen to Moses, you were in trouble. God wasn't happy with you if you rejected the teachings of Moses. Uh, some weeks back we studied the parable in uh, Luke 16, parable of uh, the rich man and Lazarus. And we saw the, the man in the parable who, who says he didn't want to listen to Moses and the prophets. He wanted a sign. He wanted someone to rise from the dead, and then his five brothers would listen and pay attention. And what did Abraham say to him? He said, no, no, no. If they refuse to listen to Moses and the prophets, even if someone were to rise from the dead, they still won't believe. Now, we have a similar situation with the Apostle Paul. Pa Paul is to us today what Moses was to the nation of Israel in the past. So now we're going to compare and contrast things. When we're studying things, it's very helpful if we can do comparisons. We compare this with something else to see what is the difference. And we need to understand that there are differences. Amen? Amen. Someone's crying, it's not too painful. <laughs> so we're going to compare and contrast just a little bit. So I'm going to ask you to turn to our verse this morning, which is Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. And I hope you have your King James Bible with you this morning. We recommend the King James Bible. And maybe one day we'll do a study on why the King James Bible is the Bible that we use. That's a big topic. I don't want to get off track with that this morning. But turn, turn in your King James Bible. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. And I'm going to back up just a little bit. Let me back up a little bit because I want to lead up to that verse. Let's go, let's, let's begin with 
beginning of the chapter, chapter 3. For this cause, I am Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. He's in chains when he's writing. For you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God. Remember we said that word dispensation means the rules of the house. What are the rules of the house? Paul's been put, Paul has been put in charge as an apostle, as a messenger sent by the Lord to give this message to Gentiles. Now you remember, God wasn't speaking to Gentiles in the past. God was only dealing with Israel. God had an exclusive covenant relationship with Israel, not with the Gentiles. The Gentiles were without hope, without God, without covenant, without blessings. They were just completely cut off from God. Right? They had just been completely turned over by God. You read the book of Romans. So it's Israel that has a relationship with God. Israel had 12 apostles. Peter and the 11. Right? They had the gospel of the kingdom. They're the ones with the relationship. Now God raises up Paul. And he sets Israel aside. Israel's program has been put on hold. Now here's the problem today. Most folks don't realize that blindness in part has happened to Israel. That God has put that program on hold because Israel, as a nation, collectively said, we will not have this man, referring to Jesus Christ, ruling over us. They refused him. They rejected Jesus Christ. They crucified Jesus Christ. And because they have rejected him, God stepped back. And instead of judging them immediately, which is what it might have happened based on all that the prophets had said, but God had a secret. God had a special program. And instead of passing judgment on the nation of Israel, there's going to be a delay in judgment. He has delayed that judgment for 2,000 years now. And God introduced a whole new program. This whole new program is called the body of Christ. It's the mystery. What was the secret? What was the mystery? The body of Christ is the mystery. The body of Christ is the secret. That's you and I, by the way. You ever read your Bible and you read things and most people just stick themselves everywhere in the Bible. They think everything in there is talking about them. Well, that's absolutely not true. That's very arrogant for us to think, so, to think such a thing. But the Bible does speak to us. It is addressing us. But we need to know where is it speaking to us? What applies to us and what doesn't apply? That's what 2 Timothy 2.15 is all about, where he says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So if we're able to rightly divide, we're able to draw distinctions between what is for us and what is not for us. Right? So when we see the law of Moses, we know because we're Gentiles and not Jews, that the law was never given to Gentiles. In other words, you don't have to pay a tithe. God isn't asking you for 10% of your income. You're able to give a free will offering. We took up a collection this morning. We didn't beat the, the tithing drum. We didn't put pressure on people to tell them to give us 10% of their income. No, we never do that. We're under grace. We have a different program than Israel had. We don't teach speaking in tongues. Why? Because it has nothing to do with the body of Christ. We are complete in Him. We're not lacking anything. We're not missing anything. When you, when you pray to God, the door is wide open. The Bible says we can come boldly and make our, our requests known to Him. God is listening. His ears are open to you. Do you have a need? Do you have a prayer request? We listed some prayers this morning. We're going to have some praise reports soon when God blesses Julius and Raquel with a great house. We're going to hear some praise reports. We're going to hear some praise reports when we hear about Elijah and his school situation. We're going to hear some praise reports when my wife gets her green card and joins me here in the United States. We're going to have some praise reports when God answers all these prayers. Why? Because he's faithful. He's a faithful God. And the Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. 
So do you want to be pleasing to God? You have to have faith. And what is faith? You've got to trust Him. God says in His words that His ears are open to you. He hears you when you pray. He's given you His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Romans chapter 8, He says, How shall He not, having given you His Son, the greatest thing He could possibly give you, surely He's going to give you the smaller thing that you ask for. Right? He's already given you the best. Now here you are asking for something that's small and almost insignificant compared to His Son. He's going to hear your prayer. And He's going to answer your prayer because He's a good God. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Well, let's read on. Uh, chapter 3, Ephesians. For this cause I, Paul, prisoner of, of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, not Jews, he's talking to Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, or on your behalf, how that by revelation he made known unto me Turn the page here. Hold on. Be known unto me the mystery. And then in parentheses he says, is I wrote before in a few words. You know, back in the book of Romans, uh, close to the end there, I think it's the last chapter, maybe verse 25, he mentions the mystery. He just briefly mentions the mystery there at the end of, Revel of uh, the book of Romans. Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Now, some people will stop and say, why do you guys always talk about the mystery? Why do you talk about Paul so much? You make too much of Paul. Well, they used to say that about Moses all the time, too. You guys talk about Moses and his law too much. Well, they weren't saying that to us, but they were saying that to the Jews in Israel, right? We don't understand God today without the Apostle Paul. We don't understand who we are unless we read Romans through Philemon. Paul wrote 13 books in the New Testament, in what is called the New Testament. Those 13 letters of Paul tell us things that are not told anywhere else in Scripture. Well, for example, if we didn't have Romans through Philemon, we wouldn't know that we're saved by grace through faith. That it's a free gift. And that no works are accepted by God whatsoever in this dispensation. There's only one writer of scripture who even says that kind of thing. Who is it? It's Paul. It's Paul. Paul does not make a big deal out of himself. But he does say, I magnify my office. Paul understood that he had a very special calling from God. When you, when you open up your Bible and it's split right in half, you've got the Old Testament, and then you have Matthew to Revelation, which people like to call that the New Testament. They use that term sparingly. About half of those books from Matthew to Revelation were written by Paul. More than 40% of what we call the New Testament is written by Paul. It's not the New Testament as such, because Paul wrote what's called the Mystery. And the mystery is those 13 letters, Romans to Philemon. So the gospel of the grace of God, our salvation, is contained only in Paul's writing. Without Paul's writing, the Bible is incomplete. He says that his writing fills up or completes the scripture. This mystery program... We've handed these out before, so everyone probably has one. So that section in the yellow, the but now, fills up and completes the Bible. The Bible is incomplete without this secret, without this mystery. And why is that so important? It's God's will for us today. When God reveals His will to you, for us to ignore God's will is to be in a state of sin. When God reveals His will by faith, we accept what God says and we move forward based on what He reveals to us. Christians often pray, Lord, what is your will for me? What is your will? I want to know God's will. Well, God tells you what His will is. Ephesians 3, 9, and He says, And to make all men, that's women included, generic, 
to make all men, all mankind see, see what? What is the fellowship of the mystery, <clears throat> which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. God had a secret. He had a secret. And God revealed the secret. And since that secret's been revealed, God doesn't want the secret to be a secret anymore. He wants everyone to know what His will is for us during this dispensation. During this economy of the past 2,000 years now, what is the church supposed to be doing? How are we supposed to be living? How are we supposed to be conducting ourselves? How are we supposed to witness and to impact society? How are we able to do that? What are we supposed to be doing? That information is in Paul's writing. If we're out here preaching law, preaching the law, we're out of order. We're not fulfilling God's will. Which reminds me of Pentecostalism. <laughs> Now sometimes people talk about revival and when they want a revival, they want that. They want jumping and shouting and speaking in tongues and people rolling around in the aisles. They had a revival at the turn of the century called uh, the Azusa Street Revival. And what did they revive? They revived an old cultic practice. Today we call it speaking in tongues. And they call that revival. That's not a revival. Well, it is a revival, but it's not a biblical revival. It's a cultic revival, or a revival of emotionalism. And most of what we see out there today is, has to do with what they call the charismatic movement. There's a revival of speaking in tongues. There's a revival of fake healing. Now, God can certainly heal people, and He does it all the time. But people do not have the gift of healing, where they can lay hands on you and raise people from the dead. And I've said this before, if you have the gift of healing, why are you setting up a tent and collecting money from people? Why don't you go to the emergency room, to the hospitals, where the, where the sick people are, and lay hands on the sick, and don't stop there, go to the graveyards and raise people from the dead, because that's what the apostles did. They had the apostolic gift. Now those apostolic gifts were temporary gifts when the church was in its infancy. And in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul talks about the church in its infancy. And he says, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I spoke like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So as the church grows up and reaches maturity, those childish things, those baby things, are put away. They're put away. So when you see Christians today speaking in tongues... They're out of order. They don't know the mystery. That's not what. That's not God's will for today. That's not a legitimate spiritual gift today. The Holy Spirit spoke through people in those days before the completion of the canon of Scripture, before the Bible was finished. The Bible's finished now. It's a, it's a complete book. It's a finished book. If someone's speaking in tongues today, with or without an interpreter, there's always supposed to be an interpreter. That message would be on par with Scripture. And that would suggest that the Bible is not a finished book. So I have a very serious problem with folks who claim that they have the gift of tongues today. That is absolutely not a biblical truth. The gift of tongues was a, was a legitimate spiritual gift back in Paul's day. And by the time Paul is close to death himself at the end of his ministry, all of those gifts had faded away. For example, if you turn quickly to oh, I think it's 2 Timothy. I didn't write the verse down, but I think I remember where it is. Yeah, it's, uh, it's 2 Timothy chapter 4. Maybe I can't find 
in the end verse here. He's, he, re he refers to, uh, I think it's uh, Tychicus or Tychus, who he says he left sick. Yeah, here it is, I found it. It's uh, chapter 4, verse 20. Now we know Paul had the gift of healing, and he even raised one fellow from the dead who fell out of the window, listening to Paul preach for quite a long time. Uh, look at verse 20, chapter 4, verse 20. He says, uh, Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Paul said, I left some guy here sick. Paul wasn't able to heal him anymore. He had the gift of healing. But it was a temporary spiritual gift. And in the beginning of his ministry, we see all the signs of an apostle that proved that he was an apostle. He was able to raise people from the dead. He was able to lay hands on the sick. He had the gift of tongues. Paul had all these things. And, he, and it demonstrated and authenticated the fact that he was an apostle. But here, at the end of his ministry, he leaves a guy sick because he cannot heal him. Now, if you have the gift of healing, you can heal people. But nobody today has the gift of healing. Nobody today has that gift. And there are a lot of folks out there who call themselves apostle this and apostle that. Well, there are no apostles today, folks. To be an apostle, the Bible says, you must have seen the resurrected Christ. You had a personal visit from Jesus himself, if you're an apostle. So how do we know that people calling themselves apostles today are not apostles? Because we know they haven't seen the resurrected Christ. Jesus hasn't come back to earth and made a personal appearance for all these folks on the internet who are calling themselves apostle this and apostle that. Amen? Amen. Let's be careful so that we're not deceived. You don't fall into a deception. So when we talk about the restoration of the mystery, how can there be a revival without truth? Amen. How can there be a revival without doctrine? And you know, this word doctrine has become a really dirty word in our time. Why? Because people don't want to be rooted and grounded in the truth of Scripture. They want their emotions to take over. They want to have an emotional catharsis where they come to church and they jump and they dance and they sing and they shout and they have this kind of a worldly party in the church. And this strange freak show, I don't know what else to call it, is supposed to be spiritual. Well, you're not spiritual without the Word of God. You're not spiritual without sound Bible doctrine. And God isn't pleased with us without the truth. Because he wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. We've got to have the truth. And to have the truth, we have to rightly divide the scripture. If we're going to understand what the word of God says, and we're going to make correct application. What is it that God wants from you? Have you ever asked yourself that question? What does God want from me? He wants you to believe His Word. You know, how are you saved? We, we, we talk about the Gospel. The gospel of the grace of God. We said you're saved by grace. God's done all the work. God gets all the credit. Well, how do we receive this free gift? We receive this free gift by faith. What is faith? Faith means I believe. The first time you heard the Gospel, that Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins, according to the scripture, that he was buried and rose from the dead. The resurrection, you can never leave that out, the resurrection. The first time you heard those three points and you believed it, you were instantly saved. God saved you so fast you didn't even know what happened to you. He did. He saved you so quick, you didn't have time to mess it up. You didn't, you didn't have time to get in there and have somebody dunk you in water. You didn't have time to speak in tongues. You didn't have time to pull out your wallet and start pouring out 10% of your income to the church. You didn't have time to help God save you. He did all the work. All you did is believe what you, what you heard. And that's what he requires. He requires belief. Now that you're saved, what comes next? Do you know that you are to continue your Christian walk the same way you started? It's by grace, through
through faith. He's done all the work. He gets all the credit. The honor belongs to him. The glory belongs to him. He's not going to share his glory with you or anyone else. He's done all the work. He gets all the credit. We walk by faith, not by sight. But the world is just the opposite. The world wants you to walk by sight. The world looks at how you're dressed. The world looks at how much money you have in your pocket. The world looks at your social standings. The world looks at what do you do for a living. The world looks at how long your hair is, or how straight your hair is, or how light or dark your skin is. The world looks at all these superficial things which are meaningless. But God looks on the inside. Right? God looks on the inside. God looks at the heart. And your heart is transformed and renewed when the Lord Jesus Christ takes up His abode in you. You're not saved because somebody dunked you in water. You're not saved because of circumcision. Now there is a circumcision. But man doesn't do that. We have a circumcision by the Holy Spirit without man's hands. The Holy Spirit cuts away that old flesh, that old sinful nature, and separates us from it. So that we can walk in newness of life. And Paul says, the life I live, live not I, but it's Jesus Christ who lives through me. How can Jesus Christ live in you and through you? He can do that by faith. Right? By grace, through faith. You hear God's word. We're, we are instructed to have the mind of Christ. If you have the mind of Christ, what does that mean? It means that you're not wiped out by the philosophy of the world. You're not getting indoctrinated by all the crap and the garbage and the junk that's out there in the world. The world laughs and mocks at Christianity. You know, just, just a few weeks ago, you know that horrible television show, The View. I call it The Pew. With those uh, three wretched women on there, Whoopi Goldberg and I don't even know the, the other three's names. They attacked the Vice President of the United States, Vice President Trump, because... Pence. Or Pence, excuse me, Vice President Trump, Vice President Pence, President Trump. They, they attacked Mike Pence, our Vice President, because he's a Christian, and because he prays, and he talks to the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of these, these wretched, I mean wretched women, attacked the Vice President because he prays, and because he believes in God, and he's a Christian, and he has faith. She goes, oh, he hears from Jesus. He must be some kind of a nut, some kind of a lunatic. And she attacked Christianity and she attacked his faith. Well, that's, that's, that's the world. That's the view or the pew of the world. I wish they would take that show off television. I've never seen so much trash and garbage come out of the mouths of three people in my life. That's a wicked, wicked show. That's, 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 that's I think, a vehicle for the yeah. devil to poison the minds of the masses. And a lot of what we hear on television is poison. And as we go through Colossians, which we'll do one day soon, Paul talks about this perspective of the world versus the, the perspective of Christ. We're saved people. We're to have the mind of Christ. We're to think Christian thoughts, godly thoughts, based on sound teaching and sound doctrine. How are you going to have a godly perspective? You can have a godly perspective because the Word of God dwells in you richly. How is the Word of God going to dwell in you richly? Because you come and you sit under the teaching ministry where the Word of God is being taught, where Scripture is being rightly divided, where you understand your position in Christ today. Now you know that it's only through Paul that we even see this expression in Christ. We're in Christ. Christ is in us. We're permanently invoked by God the Holy Spirit. Did you know that the Holy Spirit sealed you until the day of redemption? You are sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the stamp that seal, which means you can never be lost. You can never be cut off. You can never be severed from God or His presence. We have a unique position. We only know about our position in Paul's writing. Why is the mystery so important? It's important because we wouldn't know who we are. We wouldn't know where we came from. We wouldn't know where we're going. Without Paul's writings, we really don't know much of anything. Especially as members of the body of Christ. 
We only find out our position, our status, and our future home in Paul's writings. We're not citizens of the earth. Our citizenship is in heaven. Paul says we're not to set our affections on things which are on the earth. We're to set our affections on things which are above. If I set my affections on things which are above, I'm very excited over the thought of the Lord Jesus Christ returning in the sky. Amen. Amen. Many people I talk to, Christians, they are so attached to the earth. And it always makes me think of Lot, who lived in Sodom. And his wife was very attached to the Sodom, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And when it was time to go, oh, he had to pull her out, and she was kicking and screaming. He couldn't get her to leave very easily. And no sooner did they get out of the city, and they were warned by the angels, do not look back. Do not turn back into the world. And what did Lot, Lot's wife do? She turned back. Not just look back, she turned back. And she was turned into a pillar of salt. Well, you know, once you start your Christian walk with God, you're a saved person. You march forward. Right? He says we're, we're to walk circumspectly before God. And if, now once you put your hands on the plow, you don't turn around and go back to your old wicked life. You don't turn back and go back into Sodom and Gomorrah with the Sodomites. You don't turn around and go back to bondage and to slavery. We are free in Christ. We only learn about our freedom in Paul's writings. We learn about our freedom in Christ and our new position and our new status and our new location in Paul's epistles, Paul's letters. That's why it's so important. If you're to be successful in your Christian walk, if you're to love God and to learn how to love Him and to learn how to live for Him and to be successful and effective in your Christian walk, it's because you understand the program that applies to you. Without that information, we're dead in the water. Why do you think the church is so ineffective today? We turn and we look everywhere in our society today. People are so confused. Some of them don't even know if they're male or female. That's how, how confused people are today. You, you go to elementary schools and they're telling small children, you can choose. You don't have to be a boy. Would you like to be a little girl? And under Barack Hussein Obama, the boys can go into the girls' bathroom. How wicked. How deceitfully wicked. The Bible says the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? We see it in our society today. And people ask the question, well, why don't we have a revival? Why isn't there a church revival? We have, we have great evangelists like Billy Graham. What did Billy Graham teach? He taught the wrong gospel. He told people they needed to repent of their sins and feel sorry for their sins. And There's no salvation in that. You're not saved because you feel sorry for your sins. He told people you have to repent and be water baptized. He's preaching Peter's gospel, which was exclusively to Israel. So we have to have correct information. And when people ask that question, why do you talk about Paul so much? Why do you talk about Romans to Philemon so much? Why do you talk about the mystery so much? Why do you talk about dispensation so much? I talk about it so much because that's what God has instructed me to do. Amen. And if you read Paul's writing, our, we can focus on just one verse this morning, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. What is our duty? What is our call? Well, we are ambassadors for Christ. With regard to salvation, we are extending the invitation to be reconciled to God. How are people reconciled to God? How are they brought back to God? By grace, through faith, without any works of any kind. And how are we to accomplish this with our brothers and sisters who are co-laborers in the faith with us? Ephesians 3, 9. We're to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. The mystery doctrine, the secret that has been revealed, is the answer to every question that you have today. How is a man or a person made right with God? By grace, 
through faith according to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And there's no revival today without that information. Right? We look down through history and we see these revivals and they're very faith revivals, most of them. These teachings are just now being recovered. They're just now being recovered. I looked on the internet just yesterday and I saw about a dozen different ministers preaching the doctrine of the mystery online. I was very excited to see so many new ministries popping up. And it might be that they've been out there, but now that we have the internet, for, for years now we have the internet, we're able to see what's going on in the rest of the world more clearly. Right? That God has His remnant. God has a remnant of believers out there, ministers out there, who do know the truth. And it's always a minority. It's not the masses. When you see on television a church and they've got 50,000 people in the church, these, these huge astrodomes, right, with Joel Osteen or, or many of the other ones, most of those huge ministries, they do not know the gospel. They're not preaching the gospel. They're preaching some social gospel or some social message or something that's not offensive. And Jesus said, blessed is he that's not offended by me. You're blessed if you're not offended by the truth. But the world today, the Bible says Satan is the God of this world. And lost people, most of them, are very offended by the truth. So when you, when you open your mouth and you start talking about the mystery, the revelation of the mystery, you're going to be under attack. Satan doesn't want this message out there. This, is, this information on the mystery is the correct gospel to preach that saves people from their sins. Telling people to repent does not lead to salvation. Telling people that they need to be water baptized does not lead to salvation. This is the gospel of the grace of God, and it is the only way to be saved today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, let's quickly close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this chance, this opportunity to address the word of God, rightly divided, before your people, Father. Help us to grow in grace and in the knowledge and understanding of your holy word. And if there's anyone listening on video uh, that does not understand how to be saved, on the back of our brochure we have the gospel, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And I want to make it very clear to anyone who's listening how to be saved in case you're out there searching. There are three things that you need to understand. Christ died on the cross to pay for your sins. He was buried and rose again on the third day. If you will believe, simply believe the gospel, the good news, believe in Christ's death, His burial, and His resurrection, you will be instantly saved. God does all the work, and God gets the credit. Amen. Praise God.